Yeah. Okay. Welcome everyone. Uh, this to the third session of this uh, these Zoom meetings. Uh, I hope you are making the most of the course and all the activities. Just a few reminders. One is uh, last week we had asked to submit uh, the the photographs of your mini interferometer activity that if you tried at home. The last date is still uh, 20th of August, so if you you can spend some more time trying to play with it, but eventually you'll have to upload them to the course website under the activity uh, link. If you go, it allows you to upload uh, files. It will have a few restrictions as to how many files and what are the file sizes that are allowed to be uploaded. Just make sure you, you, are, uh, you maintain that. And if you have any problems, you can always contact us at NRC Gmail, uh, nrciucardgmail.com. The next one is we have set a new assignment that was made available as of yesterday night. Uh, this one, I think it, it's due next Monday. These are just, uh, there are just a few questions over there, I think about six or so, uh, which, uh, which are slightly different from the quiz that it takes slightly longer and you might have to work out a few things like derivations or evaluations to answer them correctly. Uh, so once you're done, you can also upload them. It could be either a PDF, uh, PDF that you create through LaTeX or it could be a Word file that you convert to PDF. It's pref uh, PDF is preferable, or it could even be handwritten notes. But eventually we will set up a, uh, a short quiz based on the questions that are given in the, in the assignments so that we know which ones you got it right. Because actually grading the notes might be harder. But if there is some issue that arises, we might refer to the notes that you uploaded. So it is still required that you upload all those, uh, your work assignment by the deadline, but, our, but the evaluation will be through a short quiz that's based on the assignment. Okay, just the final thing is, uh, Jean was mentioning about this Perseid showers that are gonna be apparently visible, uh, meteor showers that are gonna be visible, I think today and tomorrow the best. So maybe Jean can give more details as to where to look or any other details. I haven't done much. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Prakash. Yeah. So uh, tomorrow, yeah, may meteor shower. Yeah. Maybe see in the, the sky where you will have no clouds. Yeah. And uh, for those who will catch some pictures, yeah, photographs. Yeah. Well, it will be nice to share your material. We we try to get some. For next week, yeah, also, yeah. Now, the first thing I wanted to start with, yeah, is to give some explanation about what is on the background, yeah. And to do that, I'm going to share the screen. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure whether it works or not. I'm just doing, oh yeah, here it is. Can you see, uh, my screen now, star trails. Yeah, if yes, yeah. Yes, so, we do see it. Yeah. Okay, very fine, yeah. So there are pictures, you know, taken in the time-lapse mode, yeah, with a camera, a white field camera from Eri, so it's uh, in Devastal, yeah, the northeast of India, uh, from the four meter international liquid mirror telescope site. Yeah. And uh, it was taken last year. And uh, there are 420 pictures which have been taken, uh, 30 seconds exposure time. And what you will see is a co-addition yeah, of all those images yeah, as time goes on. Yeah. So now I will set, I try to start the video. Yep, here it starts. So you see, uh, the Earth yeah, is turning, yeah, spinning, and uh, we see many stars yeah, getting superposed yeah, to each other. And here we have just co headed yeah? So, well, Anna, my wife, did the work, yeah? Uh, 420 exposures of 30 seconds. And uh, you see, well, how bright the sky is becoming, yeah? And this has been uh, known as a Holberg's paradox, yeah? So just imagine that in the sky, we would have 420 times more stars than what we have now. Well, the sky during the night would not be dark, but it would be bright, yeah? There would be no dark sky. Yeah? And uh, this was a, a paradox, yeah? Why is a night not 
well, bright illuminated, yeah? why, why is it dark? Yeah? And there are many reasons for that. Yeah? Well, one of the reasons is that um, also the number of stars in the universe yeah, is huge, where the stars live yeah, during a certain duration and they live and they die. Another explanation also, another reason why the sky is not, is not brightly illuminated yeah, is that there is an expansion in the universe. Yeah? Then there is an interstellar extinction, yeah? the light from the star yeah, gets extinguished yeah? uh, during its path, their path, etc., etc. So this is uh, the background image that I offer to you today. Yeah? So now you know where it comes from. Yeah? It's a coalition of 420 images yeah, taken during the rotation of the Earth. Yeah. Now just uh, I want to share my screen with um, something else. So I have difficulties with the photo, I don't know why. Yeah, okay. Now I will share my screen with some reminders what we did during the previous lesson, yeah. Yeah, so you remember during the previous lesson, yeah, there was a small introduction to physotype interferometry. So what we did, yeah, uh, I described, yeah, the, the experiment of Young, yeah, a screen, yeah, with two holes. And uh, we'll, we have assumed that the two holes were infinitely small. Then the plane wave, which is a monochromatic, so just oscillating, yeah, at a very peculiar frequency, hit the screen. And then we wonder, yeah, what shall we see in a distant screen, yeah, here. And uh, where we had uh, some uh, small demonstration showing that what we should see are a series of fringes, bright and dark fringes, yeah, with um, small angular separation, which is uh, the angular separation, yeah, is given by lambda over B, yeah where lambda is a wavelength at which uh, we make the experiment, and B is a baseline, the separation between the two holes. Now, it's very important yeah, here that uh, I draw your attention to the fact that n times lambda yeah, was the difference in the length of the two light paths coming from the two holes yeah, to a given point in the screen. Yeah. Now, uh, I could also write uh, this uh, difference in light paths yeah, as follows. I could say, well, it's also equal to the time delay between the arrivals yeah, of the two light paths at that given point in the screen, yeah, multiplied by the velocity of light, of course, yeah. So let's just, re re Let's just remind, remember that uh, so the difference in the path length of the two beams coming from two holes into a given point in the screen is equal, yeah, simply to the time delay between the arrival times of these two beams multiplied by the velocity of light. Yeah? This will be uh, useful uh, later on. Yeah? Then we'll. Uh, I described the experiment of FISO, yeah, we tried with the 80 centimeter telescope of Marseille to measure the angular diameter of stars or let's say to resolve the disk of the stars. Yeah? So what he did, yeah, he just set the two holes in a screen in front of uh, the aperture of his telescope yeah? and tried to see the disappearance of the fringes because, uh, and this we have shown last time is that when uh, the angular diameter of the star yeah, is about half the value yeah, of the angular separation between two bright fringes in the Young's experiment, yeah, we would see the disappearance of the fringes. Then an important quantity that we define yeah, was the visibility of the fringes. Yeah. The visibility of the fringes yeah, is simply the difference between the brightest fringe and the darkest fringe divided by the sum of the two latter intensities. Yeah. So if we don't resolve the star, so we see a very bright and dark fringes, the dark fringes have zero intensity. We've seen that their visibility is equal to one. 
in case we resolve the star, we don't see any more, you know, fringes. So the bright fringes has a intensity equal to the, well, faintest one, yeah? So I max minus I min equals zero and the visibility is zero. So just let's remember that the visibility of the fringes vary between zero and one. Okay, then, well, I just uh, mentioned the fact that uh, uh, since uh, Stefan and Fizo didn't see the disappearance of the fringes while looking at uh, most of the bright star in the sky, well, they could uh, derive that their angular diameter would be smaller than 160 arc second. Yeah? So this was already a very nice result. Yeah? And uh, just on the basis of this measurement, if you succeed in measuring the bolometric flux of the star you are looking at, yeah, you may derive lower limit for its effective temperature yeah, by means of the uh, Stefan, uh, well, well, one of the low we, we've seen previously. Yeah. Now this is a picture showing the 80 centimeter Marseille telescope. Yeah. Then, uh, well, we just gave some clues how to build the micro micro interferometers. Yeah. And uh, so, with two holes to see the fringes, with one hole to see the airy disk. And so we invite you once more yeah, to post yeah, your pictures yeah, showing uh, the micro interferometers you may have built up. Yeah. Don't, be, don't be shy, do it. Yeah. Then I mentioned the fact that you know, uh, Michelson uh, was the first yeah, to resolve the diameter, angular diameter of the satellites of Jupiter using a small size telescope, 30 centimeters in diameter. And then, uh, in, co in collaboration with PISE, they installed a seven meter long beam on top of a 2.5 meter telescope. And they were the first to resolve the angular diameter of a bright star, yeah, Betelgeuse, yeah, Alpha Orionis. And they measured the angular diameter as being 47 mini arc second. Yeah, so that, that was the main content of the previous lesson. Now, lesson three, yeah. Yeah, you must have visualized yeah, the video on YouTube. And uh, what I would like to say, yeah, today, well, just to speak a little bit about like coherence, yeah, just a summary of the content of that lesson, yeah. Just to remind you that when uh, you're observing a star, you are never observing, yeah, you know, extremely narrow bandwidth, yeah, but with a narrow band filter, yeah, having a certain width in frequency which here is defined as delta nu. Then what, what, what kind of light we are working with then, it's called a quasi-monochromatic light because uh, the frequency is, yeah, is just in the spectral range nu plus or minus delta nu. Huh? You see it here. Now, well, to estimate yeah, the electric field produced quasi-monochromatic monochromatic light, yeah, you have to sum up, yeah, the contributions to all the frequencies, yeah, so this has been shown, yeah, in the lecture notes and also on the video, and uh, the net result, yeah, is that the final electric field, yeah, is still that of a monochromatic, monochromatic uh, light at frequency nu, yeah, but which amplitude, yeah, well, is uh, being modulated, yeah, and it's changing with a period, yeah, which is one over delta nu, where delta nu is the bandwidth, yeah, of the beam of a mono quasi monochromatic light, yeah. Now, well, intuitively, yeah, we represent the thing like that, yeah. Here I've drawn, yeah, several trains of waves with the frequencies nu prime, very close to nu, but within a very narrow bandwidth, yeah. And if you let all these uh, trains of a uh, light wave to interact, yeah, the end product yeah, is uh, still a train wave yeah, oscillating with a frequency nu, so very high frequency. But you see that the amplitude is modulated. Yeah? So the amplitude yeah, varies with a very low, at very low frequency. And the frequency is delta nu, so it's the bandwidth yeah, of the quasi monochromatic light. So this is, if we speak in terms of uh, time, yeah, 
So we represent the waves yeah, along a time axis. And uh, well, this duration, so the period with which yeah, the amplitude is being modulated, yeah, tau or t, is one over delta nu. So it's a very low frequency. Now, if you freeze the time and you look yeah, along the z axis, yeah, so it's a space axis, yeah, how the how the train of wave is distributed, yeah? Well, you see that now we, we should speak in terms of wavelengths. So the wave is still oscillating with a wavelength lambda, which is C divided by nu, yeah? But the amplitude now, yeah, shows an effective wavelength, yeah, which is called, yeah, uh, the length of coherence of your being, yeah? And, uh, the value of uh, that effective yeah, wavelength is lambda squared divided by delta lambda, where delta lambda is a bandwidth expressed in wavelength units. Yeah. Okay, now uh, what I would like to, to show you now, or to let you hear, yeah, is a small experiment. Yeah? So I will, well, I will not share the screen, but go to a sound wave generator and try to to yeah well the sound which frequency yeah is a 70 or uh, 700 hertz yeah can you hear it yes okay. okay now what i will do yeah i will mix up yeah uh, two waves which frequency differs just by one hertz so one will be a frequency of 700 hertz, and the second one will be 701 hertz. Yeah? And we should hear yeah, a modulation of the amplitude. Yeah? So let's try. Can you hear a modulation? Yeah, very, not very clearly. Could you play that again? Yeah. Okay, now I change the frequency. I go, one wave will be 700 Hertz. The second wave will be 702 Hertz, yeah? So 700 Hertz and 702 Hertz, yeah? And now I shall play, yeah? Can you hear the modulation? Could you hear it or difficult? Uh, yes, I mean, the yeah. modulation is a bit hard to- I know, I know. Really hear. Well, what we will do, yeah, we will in any case, yeah, set up a, well, a link yeah, to this uh, sound wave generator so that the participants yeah, may play with it yeah, at home. And uh, well, well, what we are just hitting, hearing yeah, is a beat phenomenon, yeah, beat phenomenon. So it's the, ampli well, it's the modulation of the amplitude yeah, when uh, several waves yeah, have a very, very nearby frequencies. Yeah? And so the, the frequency of the beat phenomenon yeah, is one over delta nu. So when I was playing, for instance, mixing uh, 702 hertz with 700 hertz, the difference is two hertz, yeah? it means a beat phenomenon, two times per second, yeah? Now, if I try again with mixing up, yeah, 700 hertz with 701 hertz, yeah? So the difference in frequency is one hertz. So now we should hear a modulation with a period of one second, yeah? So let's try, last time. Okay, so in any case, yeah, uh, I, I, I set my microphone again back. Yeah, we will just uh, give the link, yeah, so that uh, every participant, yeah, may play with a generator and understand, yeah, why. So I come back now to the presentation, yeah. Why, when we are mixing up, yeah, uh, different trains of waves, yeah, with uh, frequencies which are very nearby, yeah, there it results like uh, long train waves, 
still with the frequency new, yeah, but which amplitude is modulated. Okay, so now astronomers work yeah, with the quasi monochromatic light. Yeah? So we forgot about monochromatic light, yeah? which would be the light emitted by a laser. Yeah? So we, we just isolate yeah, a narrow band, yeah, delta nu, of frequencies, yeah? and we make the experiment. Yeah? So in the lecture notes yeah, and in the, in the video, yeah, we try to find out yeah, what is now the distribution of the light intensity in the screen of the young experiment, yeah, when the two holes are still infinitesimally, infinitesimally small, but when the light coming from a distant source, yeah, very distant, yeah, much more distant than what is shown here on the diagram, yeah, is emitting not monochromatic light, but quasi monochromatic light. So light with frequencies yeah, in the range nu plus or minus delta nu. And so there is a nice demonstration, yeah, which has been shown yeah, on the video, lecture, well, video and uh, lecture notes. Yeah? And the net result is the following, is that the intensity in the screen, yeah, yeah, is equal to the summation of the intensity from hole one, intensity from hole two, plus, yeah, and this is the difference, yeah, well, two times the intensity, multiplied by a very strange quantity, yeah, which is called the module of the complex degree of mutual coherence yeah, of the light yeah, at the, between the two holes. Yeah. And then here you have a cosine. Now you have here a phase factor. Here you have two pi nu, the frequency of the monochromatic light, quasi-monochromatic light, yeah, and tau, is a time delay yeah, between the arrival time of the light beams coming from the two holes yeah, at a given point in the screen of the Young's experiment. Okay. So now you remember, well, I've shown before, it was equation 17, that tau yeah, multiplied by the light velocity yeah, was equivalent to x times b divided by z, yeah? So you may go back to that equation number 17 later. And you, if you replace yeah, tau by that expression, you find yeah, the, the, the distribution of the light intensity in the Young's experiment is a function of the x coordinates, yeah? And uh, so you see there, are, there will be bright and dark fringes, yeah? but that the amplitude will depend on this factor. Yeah? So the module of the complex degree of mutual coherence yeah? between, uh, well, the electromagnetic field, yeah? between the two holes. Yeah? Now, if we go back now to the expression of the visibility of the fringes, yeah? which is the difference between the maximum light for the brightest fringe minus the minimum light for the darkest fringe, divided by the summation of the two, what you will get, yeah? Well, you take this expression. Now the maximum value of this, yeah, is reached when the cosine is equal to plus one. The minimum is reached when the cosine is equal to minus one, yeah? So just put this expression into the visibility expression for a maximum value of the cosine and minimum value of the cosine. And what you will find is that the visibility of the fringes, yeah, is just equal to the module of the complex degree of mutual coherence yeah, of the light between the two holes in the screen. Yeah? And this is a very nice result. Now, well, we may wonder, yeah, but what does represent yeah, this uh, complex degree of mutual coherence? And this is the subject of the next lesson. Yeah? So I won't give the answer now, but I invite all of you yeah, to, to listen yeah, to the lecture number four, and you will get the answer. Yeah? But you will see the, the answer is very nice. Yeah? It's a very aesthetically beautiful. Yeah? OK, so I shall just end my presentation now, just to remind you that uh, the coherence time yeah, uh, due to a beam of monochromatic light yeah, is one over delta nu, because it's the period of the beat phenomenon. 
yeah, period of the big phenomena, yeah. And uh, during the next lecture, yeah, I shall introduce, yeah, the length of coherence, but I already uh, said a few words about it, yeah, the length of coherence, yeah, uh, was uh, the length of this train of waves when it is represented, yeah, along the space direction, yeah, and is just equal to lambda squared divided by delta lambda. But I'll come back to that point, to that expression, yeah, during the next lesson. So I will end up now my short summary presentation, yeah, and be ready to answer your questions. Okay, thanks, Sean. Uh, so you guys must know the rules by now. You just have to raise your hand if you have a question and then I'll unmute you and you can uh, ask the question directly. If in case your mic is not working, you can always use the chat chat window to ask your question. Yeah, so maybe uh, before uh, first question arrives, yeah, uh, you remember last, last time, yeah, uh, someone raised the question saying, well, how can it work, you know, uh, with white light, yeah, it's not uh, light emitted by a beam, yeah, so where is the coherence, yeah, you know, what we are talking about, yeah, so, yeah, the answer, yeah, is the following, is that astronomers, yeah, work, yeah, with uh, not in, with monochromatic light, but with quasi-monochromatic light because they're using filters to isolate yeah, narrow band width yeah, of frequencies. Yeah? And then we've seen yeah, that if we make sure yeah, that uh, we let train waves interfere, uh, but uh, I would say part of train waves, yeah, such that the difference in, uh, in, uh, in the arrival time yeah, is less than the the period yeah, of a modulation of the quasi monochromatic light, yeah, well, it, it will work. It, it is like a monochromatic light, yeah, but you, 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 you must make sure that the time delay between the arri arrival time yeah, of the two light beams yeah, is less than the period of modulation yeah, of the quasi monochromatic light. Yeah. And uh, well, now if you, if you call yeah, uh, this uh, time delay uh, tau, and if you multiply it by the velocity of light, yeah, you'd find that uh, for the case of the uh, Michelson and the Pease experiment, yeah, uh, it would translate yeah, in a difference in length of about a few microns. Yeah? So Michelson and Pease yeah, had to make sure that the difference in length yeah, between uh, the train waves emitted by the star and eating the focal planes along two different trajectories differ yeah, by less than a few microns. Yeah? And this was a very big difficulty yeah, in experimenting because uh, when you set up your yeah, big beam, yeah, seven meter long, on top of a telescope, there are flexures, there are dilatation effects, there are many mechanical problems, there are vibrations. Yeah? And the trees, such a high precision of just a few microns yeah, was quite a mi miraculous. Yeah? So do we see any question coming? coming up? Yes. Bikram. Okay, yeah, Bikram. Go ahead, Bikram. Yeah. Uh, hello, John. Uh, thanks for the lesson today. Uh, I was wondering, we use um, uh, several broadband and narrowband filters in uh, during observation with optical telescopes. And uh, if there is a way to uh, find the coherence length or to observe the beating effect, then, uh, you know, the gradual degradation of the bandwidth of those filters can be measured. Is that possible or not? I'm just wondering just to see how is it behaving over the course of time, the filters? Well, no, I think, you know, uh, I think, well, even uh, if the is a filter quality and yeah, deteriorates a little bit uh, with time yeah uh, well i don't think uh, it would have any effect yeah well if you see that uh, maybe <laughs> there might be some problem with uh, the filter yeah you just uh, replace it with a new one but 
In the case of Michelson and Pease, yeah, they use a broadband filter, let's say 1,000 angstrom bandwidth, okay? So in, in terms of frequency, yeah, you have to divide the light velocity by the wavelength and you find out how much it is, yeah? So 1,000 angstrom in bandwidth, yeah? And they were working yeah, at an optical wavelength of about yeah, 5,000 angstrom, yeah? And uh, if you just calculate lambda square, so 5,000 times 5,000 angstrom divided by delta lambda 1,000 angstrom, yeah? You would find uh, in units of microns that it's a few microns, okay? Now, if you use, yeah, the narrower bandwidth filter, where the, the length of coherence will be larger, longer, yeah? But you'll get less light, yeah? So it will be more difficult to observe stars, yeah? Because you'll get much less flux, yeah, from them, yeah? So uh, there is a compromise, yeah? But, uh, no, yeah? Uh, well, my question now is uh, other, way, other way around. I, I mean, uh, suppose we don't know the uh, web band of the filter we are using. Can we measure that uh, if there is any way to uh, visualize the beating effect or the uh, to measure the coherence length? Uh, no, I, I don't see that. I see, uh, well, if you don't know uh, the characteristics of your filter, yeah, well, better use a collimator and a, a photometer, yeah, to determine, yeah, what is the distribution of intensity as a function of wavelengths. Yeah. This would be, uh, I would be, I would say the the most accurate and faster way and less expensive way to do, yeah? Yeah, I would not, uh, yeah, do anything about uh, trying to, to, to measure the coherent length, yeah, of uh, that filter, yeah? Well, mm -hmm. this is much more difficult, I think, yeah? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it was interesting you're talking about this trade-off between the amount of light you collect and the coherence length, which is related to the bandwidth. Mm -hmm. This this is what I suppose puts a limit on how how high a frequency you go you can go to use interferometry, right? For like you don't see interferometers in the X-rays, and I don't know whether UV is used for interferometry. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you will need shorter and shorter bandwidths to make the coherence length sufficiently yeah. long. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It will always be lambda square over delta lambda, yeah, the, the length of coherence, yeah. And uh, indeed, yeah, if you go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, yeah, it's uh, more and more difficult. Well, unless, yeah. Uh, now, well, when you are looking yeah, at the interferometric experiments, yeah, on the, well, in big observatories, yeah, well, they are using a disperser, yeah? So uh, they don't use filters, they are dispersing the fringes, yeah? And uh, now if you disperse them, yeah, very much, you get high uh, spectral resolution, yeah? But you can only address, yeah, the very bright stars, yeah? Now, mm -hmm. if you disperse less, yeah, then you may reach uh, painter stars, but you get the less the spectral resolution, yeah? So it's always a compromise, yeah? But so yeah, in practice, yeah, you know, in uh, optical observatories, yeah, they are not using uh, filters, yeah, but they are dispersing the fringes, yeah, and they get information, yeah, for a very, uh, very large number of wavelengths, yeah, at the same time, yeah? So it's very neat, yeah? Okay, we have a question from Pallav. Yeah. Go ahead, unmute. Hello. Um, yeah. um, uh, your voice is breaking a bit. Uh, try again. We don't hear you at all. Uh, you're muted, Pallav. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, I have observed a very nice thing that uh, whenever uh, sunlight incident on a spider net, not every time in a particular uh, in few cases I have seen that it creates a beautiful pattern sometimes uh, that colors is uh, that 
uh, that emerging from that uh, spider net and uh, does it a, uh, is it a, a consequence of of uh, interference yeah so very nice question yeah and uh, what what we'll try to do yeah during this week is to find a net some sunlight yeah and to look at it yeah and then i'll give you the answer during the next lesson yeah the reason is that you remember last time yeah someone raised also a question he said well I tried to measure the angular diameter of Jupiter, yeah, with a one millimeter thick wire, yeah. Then, uh, well, I had the impression to see, uh, well, interference of light, yeah. So I don't remember who who raised that question, yeah. But so we did. Well, I just said then, well, we should experiment ourselves, yeah. So with my wife, yeah, we we looked at Jupiter. We took a wire, one millimeter thick, yeah. And uh, we we put it at a distance of 20 centimeter from our high, and we looked at Jupiter, yeah, and whoa, <laughs> we were seeing very awful things, yeah. Well, we were seeing uh, Jupiter all around the, the the wire, and well, what what was the reason? What is interference interference of light or or not? No, I think it was a problem with our heights, yeah, because you know, well. If you look at Jupiter, yeah, you must accommodate to infinity, yeah. And now, if you want to see a one millimeter thick wire at a distance of twenty centimeter, you have to accommodate very, very close, yeah. And you cannot do both at the same time, yeah. And I think this was the reason why, when uh, that participant tried to measure the angular diameter, yeah, of Jupiter, yeah, he was seeing uh, very strange things, yeah. So you may try to do it yourself, yeah. Then we made the calculation, yeah, in fact, yeah, at what distance, yeah, at which distance from your high, we should have set the wire to occult the disk of Jupiter. In fact, right now, yes, yeah, the angular size of Jupiter is about 50 seconds of arc, yeah, which means that a one millimeter thick wire should have been set at a distance of four meter from, from four meters from our high, yeah, you see? so. This is much longer distance, yeah, than the 20 centimeter that the participant tried, yeah. So, so I think the inter interference that he was seeing, yeah, was probably a problem with high that we are not able at the same time to accommodate uh, to infinity and very near, yeah. Now, if we would set yeah, the wire at a distance of four meter, it would be much easier, yeah, to accommodate, yeah, uh, between Jupiter and the wire. So now, with regard yeah, to the spider spider net experiment, yeah. So we'll try to do it this week. Yeah, a very nice experiment. Thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, and I invite yeah, uh, well participants yeah to try doing the same. Yeah. So I don't know what is the answer. Yeah, because uh, well, I I never and, saw. Uh, yeah. And I think uh, there is a special kind of butterfly is named Morpho butterfly. Uh, the 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 color is blue, bright blue, uh, magnificent blue color. But that blue color is also a consequence of uh, interference pattern, which is known as structural color. So Correct. that is also one very nice. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah. we 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 had the opportunity of seeing those very big butterflies, yeah, which are called morphos, morphos, yeah. You know, where is our either green or blue light uh, butterfly with a size uh, which can be, uh, well, a few tens of centimeters. Yeah? And you're right that uh, the very nice color we see from them yeah, is the result of interference. Yeah? So nature yeah, has invent, invented also yeah, the phenomenon of interference yeah, before optical astronomers thought about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So thank we invite you. Participants to try that experiment, yeah, to observe a spider net, yeah, uh, when it is being illuminated by sunlight, yeah, and uh, see um, this maybe inter inter interfering phenomena, yeah, yeah. Now, Thank yeah, Thank yeah, you, sir. yeah, with pleasure, yeah, yeah. Now you, that you had some trouble with the uh, finding the angular size of Jupiter, but uh, so you think the Galileo's experiment is reproducible or not? Yeah, well, you see, in the case of uh, Galileo, yeah, 
Uh, the thing disk he measured, well, because it was not the angular diameter of a star, but it was a thing disk, was five seconds of arc. Yeah? So we, we calculated yeah, at what distance yeah, he should have set his high uh, to occur the star. And the answer is, uh, well, 10 times larger than if you want to occur the, the, the disk of Jupiter, yeah? because 50 seconds of arc compared to five seconds right. of arc yeah, right. is a factor of 10. Yeah? So he should have set his high at a distance of 40 meters, yeah? Now, well, is there, it would be a very nice experiment, yeah, to look at a star, yeah, low on the horizon, set a wire one millimeter thick, go, yeah, at a distance of about uh, 40 meters, and see whether you have a chance to occur the star, yeah? Well, it would be a very nice experiment, yeah, to be carried out. I don't know what is the answer, yeah, but, well, you know, the story says that Galileo, yeah, could resolve, yeah, the disk of stars, yeah, and estimate their angular diameters as being five seconds of arc. But, but the answer is that if the thickness of the wire is one millimeter, you should go at a distance of 40 meters. If it is a two diameter, well, two millimeters in diameter, you should go at 80 meters away, yeah? Yeah. Oh, so, right. good scales. Yeah. It's a scary experiment, yeah? Well, we should try, yeah. So, Prakash, if you have some time, <laughs> just go ahead. <laughs> we don't see stars. I don't think we'll see for a, for no, a few weeks right. now. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. I'll try at some point. Yeah, me too. I, I, we'll try if, if, if we have a chance, yeah. yeah sure, sure. Uh, so, uh, next question is from Deepak. Deepak, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Hello? Yeah, go on. Yes. Uh, you'll have to speak a bit louder. Okay, okay. Uh, right. Is it clear? Yes. Yes. Okay. So in the derivation, you have used an electric field with only one polarization. Is it because is it because uh, polarization doesn't have anything to do with the uh, derivation or? Uh, uh, yeah. Or... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's good that you mentioned it. Yeah, that electromagnetic. Electromagnetic field, yeah, is composed anyway of um, electric field and a magnetic field, of course, yeah. And we know that uh, both components, yeah, carry about the same amount of energy, yeah. So everything what has been written, yeah, uh, about the electric field is also valid for the, the the magnetic field, yeah. And well, until now we have supposed that uh, the light was unpolarized, yeah. So, I mean, uh, now if you if you work with a, a field of a polarized light, yeah? Then, well, you should make sure is that your interferometer doesn't introduce polarization, yeah, in the beams, yeah? So, this is very tricky, yeah? Well, I'm not really very much aware, yeah, of uh, experiments, yeah, precise experiments which have been made, yeah, in interferometry and controlling, you know, all, uh, all these effects. You know, in the case of the VLTI, so the very large telescope interferometer, I think the number of mirrors, yeah, reflecting the light uh, between uh, the main aperture, yeah, and the focal plane, yeah, is of the order of, uh, I would say, 20, yeah, surfaces, yeah, yeah. So I, I checked the exact number, yeah. And we know that at each reflection, yeah, there will be uh, some amount of uh, polarization being induced, yeah. So at the end, yeah, it will be very extremely difficult, yeah, to to know whether um, polarization comes from your instrument or or from the star. But in principle, yeah, uh, I think uh, this should be controllable, yeah, and uh, you should be able to, yeah, to to deal uh, with those effects. But I'm not aware of, of anyone, yeah, who has succeeded already in doing it, yeah. But it could be very interesting, yeah. So did, did I answer your question? Maybe no, Deepak? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, but in the same I voice cannot still loud. hear you. Can I speak louder? Louder, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I was thinking that each uh, photon which is coming has its own uh, pattern being in introduced in the Young's double slit, right? So uh, each photon, each photon uh, coming at the Young's double slit will have its own pattern, right? If the polarization is different. 
Yeah, but or... remember, yeah, but remember that you know, well, to interpret as yeah, a young experiment, you have to think in terms of uh, wavefront, yeah, not of single photons, right? Yeah, okay. it, it is where you know well, there's a duality yeah, between uh, representing yeah, light as being composed of photons or as being a wavefront, yeah, differs and uh, well, you you need yeah to represent uh, uh, the light as a wave yeah to understand yeah properly understand yeah the, okay. the young's experiment yeah okay. Okay. yeah there seems to be a question uh, sort of technical one in the chat window, chat window from uh yes. Hui. He asked whether there's a mistake in calculation. This is regarding your notes, I think. Yeah. Equations 26 and 27. So just a moment, yeah. I just have a look. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah. I should. 26, 27? Yeah. Yeah. So I just go 26. 26. Is the argument T on the left side? I don't quite understand the question. Uh, 26 and 27. No, I don't see uh, something to do with the argument t at the left of the equal sign. Yeah. So well, I I I, I invite yeah uh, I invite him yeah to to look at the video on YouTube. Understand yeah what we did yeah to to go okay. from equation twenty six to twenty seven yeah. Uh, there is some intermediate results that you will see on the video in on YouTube yeah. Mm -hmm. It's because we made uh, some uh, time translation, yeah, and this is the reason why, yeah, you may be surprised yeah, how we go from 26 to 27, but it is explained, yeah, on uh, the video, on the YouTube video, okay? Yeah, Zheng Hui, you could probably elaborate it in the forum if, if it's still not clear to you. Yeah, okay. so mm -hmm. there are more questions now? Um, don't think so. Suhita asked, can you explain the background picture, which... Yeah, okay. I think she missed so, it in the beginning. Yeah, so I think it's uh, Suhita, yeah, who asked the yes. question, yeah. So, well, we'll do it once more, yeah. I will just explain, yeah, the background picture. I will share my screen, yeah. Uh, okay. And go here, yeah. So here, here is a video, yeah. That I will show you in a moment. Oops. Yeah. So it it will represent yeah star traits yeah. Uh, photographed yeah with a uh, with regular camera, but uh, taking one picture of the sky every thirty seconds, and the duration of exposure yeah is also about thirty seconds yeah. So I just start the video. And you see here, well, it's maybe uh, the co-addition yeah, of several tens of images, yeah? So each uh, 30 seconds in time, yeah? And le le let's assume, yeah, that uh, we co-edit here 10 images, yeah? This is how the, the sky would look like, yeah? If, yeah, uh, the sky contains 10 more stars than what you see today, yeah? And uh, when in the 19th century, well, Holbers, yeah, who was, I think, was an astronomer, yeah, had the following idea. He said, well, if the universe is populated, yeah, with an infinite number of stars, yeah, uh, then all the disk of the star, yeah, should result, yeah, in the sky being uh, fully illuminated by the light from the stars, yeah. And why is the sky dark at night, yeah? And this was a paradox, yeah? And, uh, well, it took some time, yeah, before astronomer found the explanation, yeah? Now, well, I just let the video go. And in total, what you see is a coaddition of 420 frames, yeah? So if the sky would be populated, yeah, by 420 times more stars, this is how it would look like. And indeed, the sky wouldn't look dark at night. Yeah, it would look bright, yeah? So this is the whole burst paradox, yeah? And uh, to, well, give uh, 
explanation why the sky is dark at night, yeah? Uh, people invoked yeah, many different reasons. Yeah? One reason is that, well, even, even if the number of stars yeah, is uh, uh, huge, yeah, their lifetime yeah, is a finite. Yeah? Well, you know, the very bright star, massive stars, yeah, just live yeah, uh, some tens of millions of years, but not uh, billions of years. Yeah? Then there is also the expansion of the universe. Yeah? As you know, there is a redshift. Yeah? As uh, you're looking farther and farther away, yeah? Uh, the spectrum of those objects is more and more redshifted, yeah? So, uh, oh, visible light yeah, falls in the far infrared or even radio wavelength, so you don't see it yeah, at optical wavelength. And when there were many other reasons, yeah, like uh, extinction yeah, by dust in the interstellar medium, so the light from the star is being scattered, yeah, and uh, goes away from, from uh, our side view, yeah? So uh, there were many arguments brought up, yeah, to explain why the sky, yeah, is dark at night, yeah? So what, what, what you see here, and you see there are many colors, yeah? Uh, blue, yellow, red, greenish, etc. And this is the really the reflection, yeah, of the colors of the stars, yeah? So if you have a good eyes, yeah, and look at the star, you will see that they have different colors, and you may see it, yeah, on this picture. So, if there were many, many more stars on the sky, this is how, you know, the sky would look like. Yeah? But it doesn't because of the many reasons yeah, I've invoked before. Yeah? Okay, so is there other questions in the meantime? Or in yeah, the there's chat? just one question in the, in the chat window sent to me. Uh, yeah. Nikita is asking about uh, how Newton found this angular size of Vega. So she asked if he assumed that the Vega has the same luminosity and size as the sun, then by default, it will have the same temperature as the sun, whether that statement is correct or not. Yeah, so it, just a moment, yeah, because probably I was not listening to everything. So I just read the- uh, I'll copy paste it, it will send- Yeah, is it from Nikita Rawat? Yes. Yeah, hi, sir, I'm confused about the assumption oh, made by sorry. Newton. If you assume that the Vega is the same luminosity and same size as the sun, then by default, Vega is the same temperature. Hi, sir, I have a doubt regarding assumption made by Newton. If you assume that Vega is the same luminosity and same size as the sun, then by default, it is the same temperature as the sun, yeah? Yeah, of course, yeah, you're absolutely right. But, you know, oh, well, at that time, yeah, already, yeah, the, well, very eliminated idea to think that the stars, yeah, could be just, well, object entities like the sun, yeah, was fantastic, yeah? You, would you agree? People could have thought maybe, uh, well, what we call the stars are maybe just moons, yeah? Or maybe there are, you know, other exotic objects, yeah? So the very bright idea of Newton to think that, well, maybe Vega is a star, something like, well, is a star, but, it's just a sun, yeah, a kind of sun, yeah, was a very bright uh, assumption, yeah. And uh, so, well, this was his assumption. He said, well, let's assume, yeah, that Vega is just a star like the sun, having same uh, luminosity, having same radius, yeah. And then he said, well, then its angular diameter, yeah, would be about, yeah, two, two or three mini arc seconds, yeah. So, of course, it was, uh, maybe wrong assumption, yeah, to think that Vega is like the sun. Of course, we know it's not the case, yeah, but already thinking that, you know, the sun and the star and, and Vega, yeah, are stars, yeah, was a fantastic idea, yeah, because uh, at that time they had no spectrographs, yeah, they had uh, very re re rudimentary tools, yeah. So in this sense, yeah, uh, the proposition of Newton, yeah, was extremely bright, yeah, very, very nice assumption, yeah. So we know that in details, yeah, it's not correct. It's there, you're right, yeah. So it's okay, Nikita, did we properly answer your, your, your question? Yeah. Yeah, then, yeah, I see there is a, 
yes, there is a, a comment, yeah, by Zeng Wizu, yeah. Yes, I watched the video, is there a book you can recommend so that you can see the calculation details. Sometime I cannot see the writings on the blackboard because the video is a little blurry sometimes. Well, yeah, yeah, if you cannot see the detailed calculations, yeah. Well, no, I, I already mentioned that, you know, there are no uh, really uh, very, very basic textbook, yeah, on inter optical interferometry, but sometimes you could uh, try to get the lecture notes, yeah, after some uh, summer school, yeah, on interferometry. And uh, whether there exists, yeah, you, could, you should go into, into the libraries, yeah, and ask, uh, whether you could find yeah, lecture notes yeah, on uh, uh, optical interferometry summer schools, yeah, and there you you will find some additional information, yeah, but uh, very basic books, yeah, I'm not I'm personally not aware. They are, uh, <laughs> you know, very uh, technical books, yeah, and uh, this you could go after having been introduced to the subject, yeah, so. So, yeah, so this is just a comment, yeah, to, to Zeng Wizu, yeah? Just go to your librarian and ask whether you could find in the library, yeah? Textbook, yeah, after summer schools, yeah, on optical interferometry, yeah? And then where there are different presentations and maybe you'll find what you're looking for, yeah? Yeah. Well, now, if you have a very specific question, you know, something you, you don't understand, yeah? Well, don't hesitate yeah, to, to go onto the forum yeah, and raise a question saying, well, I don't understand you know, how yeah, you pass from that equation to the next one. Yeah? And you know, well, it will be a pleasure yeah, to provide yeah, uh, some clarifications. Yeah? Don't hesitate to do that. Yeah? Okay, I think uh, that's about it. There are no other further questions. We can probably stop here. Yeah. Okay, great, bye. Yeah. Okay, so no more questions. Yeah, so shall we reconvene uh, next week? Yeah. Yeah, next Monday. Next week. Next Hope Monday, you guys yeah. all go through the next lecture before you come to this meeting so that you have questions about it. Yeah, so that absolutely. would be the fourth video, that is lecture 2B. Right. Yeah, and uh, well, don't. You know, well, inferometry yeah, is uh, apparently an easy subject, but when you think, yeah, in a very in many details, yeah, well, you, you know, there are questions which are arising in your mind and you try to understand, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this is wonderful, yeah, because uh, it's a very nice subject, yeah, for your brain, yeah, to work, yeah, and to think. And uh, I would always advise you at night before you go to sleep, yeah, well, to have last reading or visual, visual, visualization yeah, of one of the video and uh, well, raise a question in your mind and maybe in the next morning yeah, you'll get the answer. Yeah? And if not, don't hesitate to go on, on the forum, yeah? raise the questions yeah, with a new subject yeah? and uh, it will be a pleasure yeah, for us to interact with you. Um, okay. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, with pleasure. Yeah, and uh, see you next week, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, if yeah. you have a chance to observe the Perseids, yeah, well, uh, right. we may share the material and uh, observing the spider, uh, mm -hmm. the spider net also, yeah, and uh, maybe also uh, measuring the angular size of uh, Jupiter. <laughs> so, yeah, if you have any results, yeah, just share right. it with us. Yeah. Yeah. So, bye bye. Bye. Thanks, Joe. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Joel. Bye. 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 Bye